So glad you're here today. Let me do a couple of very quick announcements and then we'll introduce our chapel speaker. So this week is the W.H. Griffith Thomas Lectureship and I'm gonna explain a little bit about that in about two minutes. But on Thursday night, we are doing a panel discussion with both of our speakers. So you'll hear a speaker today, uh, Dr. Arnold, you'll hear Dr. Nichols tomorrow. And then on Thursday night, we're gonna do a panel discussion with both of them Lamb Auditorium, 7 o'clock, free food. I know, right there. Um, But yeah, we'll have snacks for you to come and kind of follow up conversations based on what you're hearing for chapel on, on these two days. And again, with our theme of the centrality of the scriptures. On Friday 15th, We're going to have a Thursday evening chapel, but prior to that evening chapel, we're going to have a Valentine's banquet. And it says it's going to be a wonderful buffet dinner uh, right before the evening chapel. It is $5 per person, and you get door prizes included. So I'm always excited about door prizes. And this is for married couples, and it's for single friends. We want everybody to come and be a part of this. And it's going to be a QR code you'll see up there to register. Space is limited. And then finally, getting ready for our World Evangelization Conference, WEC. That is going to be March 4th through the 7th. Is We cancel classes for the entire week. Now, that is not two weeks of spring break. You, because we want you to come and participate. This is the heartbeat of Dallas Theological Seminary is for the world. And you have opportunities to attend main sessions, workshops, times of prayer, and other activities. And everything you need to know is found on weckweek.org. So I'd love to have you for that as well. Well, let me once again kind of explain about our lectureship. The W.H. Griffith Thomas Memorial Lectureship. In 1921, Dr. William Henry Griffith Thomas, outstanding Anglican scholar and professor of Old Testament exegesis at Wycliffe College in Toronto, Canada, met with Lewis Berry Chafer, who was our founder, to consider and pray about creating a new seminary. In 1924, those prayers were answered in the Evangelical Theological College, you know it better as Dallas Theological Seminary, was born. Unfortunately, W.H. Griffith Thomas died that same year, but this lectureship is a memorial to his commitment to the ideals of Dallas Theological Seminary. Each year, we invite scholars from across the evangelical world to come and speak on topics at a little bit deeper level than what we normally get to do within the classroom. And this year's theme with the centennial is that we are looking at the centrality of Scripture, one of our core themes here at the seminary. And we have two speakers. Today, you're going to hear from Clint Arnold, who I'm going to introduce in just a second. And then tomorrow, you're going to hear from Dr. Stephen Nichols. So let me introduce Dr. Clint Arnold to you. Dr. Clint Arnold is research professor of New Testament at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. He earned his PhD at Aberdeen University, and he's an alumnus of both Talbot and Biola. He served as the dean of Talbot for 10 years and is the past president of the Evangelical Theological Society. Dr. Arnold is the editor of the 20-volume Zondervan Exegetical Commentary of the New Testament, which he wrote the volume on Ephesians. And he's recently completed a commentary on Colossians for the word biblical commentary. He served as a preaching, teaching pastor at Church Project Orange County, and he's married to his wife, Barbara. And Barbara is here today, if you don't mind just waving. Thank you so much for being here. And they have three adult sons and three grandchildren. Dr. Arnold, so glad you're here. Thank you, George. So again, thank you for that very generous and kind introduction. My mom would have loved that. Um, <clears throat> she would have had a bit more to add, I think, but uh, she would have loved it. It's great to be here at Dallas Theological Seminary. I've had a strong connection with many faculty and people here at Dallas for so many years. It started in our student days when my wife and I were students at Biola University, and her best friend going through Biola was Liz Ryrie Anthony. And we went to Aberdeen, where I did my doctoral work on Ephesians, and I took trips occasionally down to Tyndale House in Cambridge, 
And during that period of time, there was a man named Harold Honer that was working on a commentary on Ephesians, and it was great to sit and chat with him about Ephesians and learn from him. And I asked him back then in 1985, when do you think you'll have your commentary done? He says, oh, another year or two. Well, 17 years later, it was a joy to see that finally appear. But I've just had such deep friendships with so many people, Dave Lowry, Daryl Bach, Michael Anthony, Buse Fanning, Vic Anderson, Dan Wallace, and so many more, Gene Merrill. And uh, in the last 10 years, well, the 10 years I was dean anyway, it was a delight to get to know Mark Bailey and Mark Yarborough. And I just want to assure them that every time I refer to Dallas Theological Seminary as Talbot, Texas, I'm just showing the camaraderie and the alignment of mission that we all have. No imperialistic notions at all. So I am very grateful for the opportunity to speak in this lecture series. Griffith Thomas was an amazing servant of God who was thoroughly committed to the centrality of Scripture for his life. In fact, uh, as a young believer, I remember reading his commentary, a, a brief little commentary on Hebrews, and how meaningful that was for me and how helpful it was for understanding the Word. He concluded his wonderful little book entitled How We Got Our Bible with these words. All that has been said may be summed up in the words of Job. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Griffith Thomas lived out this commitment to the Bible in his life and in his service and in his ministry. And it's a privilege to be here remembering and honoring uh, his years of service. Well, for my contribution to this series, I would like to focus our attention on one verse out of the Apostle Paul's letter to a group of believers in the small town of Colossae, which was about 100 miles inland from Ephesus. And by the way, this is amazing news, but the archaeological department at Pamukkale University in Turkey announced two years ago that the excavation of Colossae would soon begin under the direction of archaeologist Dr. Barish Yaner. Please join me in praying that it actually happens. <laughs> There's so many obstacles yet to overcome, and I've been hoping beyond hope that before I die, they might find some stuff at Colossae. Well, when Paul writes to the Colossians, he admonishes them to keep the Scripture central in their lives. He expresses it in this way in Colossians, in chapter 3, verse 16, and this is my own translation of that text, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly by teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom with spiritual psalms, hymns, and songs, and with gratitude singing in your hearts to God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's tantamount to us hearing him say, let the scripture be central in your lives. But he's more specific in this verse by calling these believers to make the word about Christ, the word of Christ, central. That is, the teaching about Jesus Christ, about his person and work, and that that should be something they pursue and endeavor to understand deeply. Well, Paul wrote this wonderful letter to the Colossians roughly five to seven years after the churches had been planted in the Lycus Valley. And during his three-year ministry in Ephesus, a man named Epaphras came from Colossae all the way to Ephesus, heard the gospel from Paul, and spent enough time with him to become deeply rooted in the faith. He, in turn, took the gospel, went back to his home valley, and planted churches in the closely connected cities of Colossae, Laodicea, and Herapolis. After Paul abruptly ended his ministry in Ephesus due to the uprising of the adherents of the Artemis cult, he traveled to Macedonia and on to Corinth and from there on to Jerusalem. And shortly after his arrival, he, arrest, he was arrested on false charges and then transferred to Caesarea where he was in Roman custody for two years. Then, after appealing to the emperor, he experienced a bit of a voyage to Rome. 
and was under house arrest until he could appear before Nero at his trial. And it was at this time that he wrote four letters that we know in our Bibles as Colossians, Philemon, Ephesians, and shortly later, his letter to the Philippians, all while he was in chains. He likely wrote Colossians early in AD 60, since we know that a major earthquake devastated that city later in that year. According to geological studies, there was a fault that went through the Denizli Basin that was capable of producing a quake of up to a magnitude 7.1. We know about quakes in Los Angeles, but nothing like that. Although we do know, we do not know the precise magnitude of the quake that struck in that area then, it was strong enough to level the city of Laodicea and likely also level the city of Colossae. And there's no sign that Paul knew of this earthquake when he wrote his letter to the Colossians. Paul wrote to the Colossians to address a pastoral concern about the unhealthy influence of a dangerous teaching threatening the church there. There was a mix of beliefs and practices that a factional leader and his followers were presenting to the church. Some of these practices may seem very odd to us. They included things like invoking angels, engaging in visionary experiences, varied ritual observances, observing a variety of different taboos, severe treatment of their bodies, and keeping all kinds of scrupulous uh, rituals. Although Paul referred to this teaching as a philosophy in chapter 2, verse 8, I don't think it is a philosophy in an academic sense, such as we'd have with Platonism or Aristotelianism or Stoicism or even Gnosticism. But it's probably a philosophy in the same sense that the magicians, enchanters, and sorcerers are spoken of as philosophers in the Septuagint of the book of Daniel. My own conviction is that there was a shaman figure at Colossae who was attracting a following and beginning to have a significant influence on the church there. He probably operated much like the reputed Jewish chief priest Sceva in Acts chapter 19, and was attempting to serve the community with esoteric wisdom and knowledge to help people through exorcisms, healings, and dealing with curses in the evil eye. At the heart of Paul's polemic against this person's teaching and ritual practices, Paul says he's not holding tight to the head, who is Christ, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together, through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. Part of his strategy in addressing the Colossian believers is to appeal to them to turn their eyes to Christ and become more deeply rooted in their knowledge of him. And many Bible teachers and scholars have thus rightly spoke of the Christological focus of Colossians and have aptly used the phrase, solus Christus, Christ alone, to encapsulate its teaching. But Paul was not speaking of a Christ learned from visionary experiences or the product of one's own imagination, but the Christ revealed in the Word of God. He urges the Colossians then to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. But when we think about the Word, however, in a mid-first century context, we've got to remember that they didn't have a completed Bible like we have in our possession today. Many of the books of the New Testament had not yet been written. So what does Paul mean when he speaks of the word of Christ? Well, first of all, I think a better way of translating this phrase would be the word about Christ. In Greek, we would call this an objective genitive. It would include the teaching that Christ has given, but would go beyond that to the teaching about Christ taught by Paul and the apostles. In particular... For the Colossians, I would suggest that it would include the following five things. First, this word about Christ would include the oral tradition of Christ's sayings and discourses that Paul had committed to memory 
and had passed on through his intense periods of teaching during his ministry in Ephesus. Many of these oral and some written traditions, of course, later came to be incorporated into the Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John. Secondly, the word about Christ would have entailed this, the Septuagint as the Bible of the Jewish diaspora synagogues, and now accorded great value by Gentiles in the churches. The teaching about Christ would include messianic interpretation of many texts, which were understood by the apostles and early Christian teachers to be pointing to Christ. Thirdly, the word about Christ would entail the early Christian summaries of the gospel message, such as we have encapsulated in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that says, For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, and that he rose on the third day according to the Scripture, and then he appeared. Fourth, the word about Christ would also entail early Christian hymns that were intensely Christological, such as we have in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, Hebrews 1, 1 through 3, and Colossians 1, 15 through 20. And the fifth thing I would mention about the teaching about Christ is apostolic teaching about the person and work of Jesus Christ that Paul could refer to succinctly by his phrase, the faith. What Paul taught about Jesus during his intense periods of teaching in the hall at Tyrannus in Ephesus was learned and passed on to the Lycus Valley Christians by Epaphras. And although the Colossians probably didn't possess a copy of Paul's letters, such as Romans, we can safely assume that much of the doctrinal content that Paul wrote in Romans, he had orally taught, not only in Ephesus, but in all the churches that he planted. So then Paul enjoins the Colossians to let all this teaching about Christ be the focus of their thoughts and allow its significance to penetrate deeply into their souls. He uses here a metaphor of taking up residence into their souls to express how central and foundational the words of Christ and the teaching about him should be in the lives of every believer. He even adds the adverb, richly, to characterize how deep how abundant, how influential, how central, and how utterly all-encompassing the words should be in their lives. I kind of like the translation of the term by the Geneva Bible in the 1534 Tyndale version as plenteously. Let the word of Christ dwell in you plenteously. There's just some nice ring about that. Paul wants the Colossians to devote themselves to learning more about Christ, meditate on who he is, what he has done, what he is currently doing in the church, and what he will do in the future, and for that to profoundly influence every aspect of their lives. By contrast, the oppositional teachers at Colossae are failing to look to Christ and to be determined by his teaching. So as Paul evangelized and established communities of believers, and oversaw the establishing of others, as with Epaphras in the Lycus Valley, he was passionate about helping to ground these people in a firm knowledge of Christ and the faith. His comments here about admonishing and teaching everyone would take the readers back to the previous chapter where he described the goal of his ministry in this way. In Colossians 1.28, he says, We proclaim him, admonishing every person and teaching every person in all wisdom that we might present every person mature in Christ. In a similar way, in Ephesians, he explains that the goal of the ministry is that we may all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. Although he could not be present with the Colossians, he could pray for them. And he asks regularly, he says this, So from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. 
He says that this teaching and admonishing must be done in all wisdom. In Paul's view, Christ is the source of all wisdom. He says, in fact, in chapter 2, verse 3, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In fact, the poetic hymn of praise to Christ in Colossians 1, 15 to 20, at the outset of the letter, uses the language of personified wisdom to characterize Christ. Now, in the second part of Colossians 3.16, Paul describes one of the means by which the word should permeate their lives. He says, by teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom with spiritual psalms, hymns, and songs. Now, I need to note that the word by is not in most English translations. It's an interpretation of two present tense participles. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly um, is followed then by these two participles. Many of the versions, such as the ESV, the Net Bible, and the New American Standard, simply retain ambiguity when they translate them and render it something like, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Still others interpret them as imperatives, uh, teach and admonish each other. Others take them in a more temporal sense, while you teach and admonish one another. But I would suggest that it's best to interpret these as participles of means by which these Colossian believers would receive the word. It stresses how the word of Christ should dwell within them. Let me rephrase it this way. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly by teaching one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This grammatical construction, a present imperative followed by a present participle interpreted as expressing means, is common in Paul's writings. It's also the best way of interpreting a couple of other passages in Colossians. And the parallel passage in Ephesians 5.18 and 19, I think, should be taken in the same way. Be filled with the Spirit by speaking to one another with spiritual psalms, hymns, and songs. In Ephesians, corporate worship is not the only way to be filled with the Spirit. It's rather one important way of experiencing the Spirit. The main thrust of this passage in Colossians is that believers can grow in the knowledge of Christ through the lyrics of the church's psalms, hymns, and songs of worship. We must remember that the majority of believers in the Colossian church would have been non-literate and would not even have possessed a copy of the Bible. And once again, for them, owning a copy of the Bible could only mean owning a copy of the Septuagint at that time. The lyrics, then, of musical worship became a significant way for learning about Christ and thinking about him and meditating on his excellencies. With most of mainstream scholarship today, I would regard Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20 as an early Christian hymn that was approved and cited by Paul at the outset of his letter Although we don't know who wrote it or where it was composed, whether it was composed in Palestine or Syria or Asia Minor, it was likely known and sung regularly by folks living in Colossae, Laodicea, and Herapolis. When Paul writes this letter with the goal of calling these believers back to a deeper commitment to Christ and to resist the influences of the dangerous teaching threatening the church, He cites this hymn as one with which they would be familiar. Serves as the foundation of his whole argument on why they need to focus on Christ and hold tightly to him. It's because he is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, in the heavens and upon earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and all things hold together in him. 
And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he would be preeminent in everything. For in him all the fullness was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself. By making peace through the blood of the cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Although this hymn of praise to Christ doesn't conform to Greek meter, it is an example of a Jewish form, similar to what we would find in the Psalms or in the Qumran hymn book called the Hodeyot. By citing this hymn, Paul is taking a strongly rhetorical approach to his Colossians readers. It's, it's like saying to them, Hey, folks, you're singing these marvelous words of praise to Christ every week. Think about what you're singing. Bring your lives into alignment with what you're affirming. Don't give in to the teaching and dictates of the opposing teachers. Christ alone is sufficient. The use of music for instructing people about the contents of the Bible and about Jesus Christ had an ongoing history in the development of Christianity. Although the Bible was not translated into English until the time of John Wycliffe in the 14th century, paraphrases of the scripture from the Latin Vulgate were crafted into poems and songs in Old English or Anglo-Saxon as early as the 7th century. At that time, a herdsman by the name of Cademan living on the Yorkshire coast in England, wrote numerous songs telling the stories of the Bible. The English historian Beattie, writing in the 8th century, says of Cademan, whatever he learned from the Holy Scriptures by means of interpreters, he quickly turned into extremely delightful and moving poetry. In English, which was his tongue. By his songs, the minds of many were often inspired to despise the world and to long for a heavenly life. As historian David Daniel notes, Cademan did this at a time when very few people living in Britain could read or write, much less be familiar with documents in church Latin. Beattie notes that Cademan put to song the scriptural stories of the creation of the world, the origin of man, all the history of Genesis, the departure of the children of Israel out of Egypt, their entrance into the promised land, and many other histories from Holy Scripture. He also composed songs about the life and work of Jesus, the incarnation, passion, resurrection of our Lord, his ascension into heaven, as well as the coming of the Holy Ghost and the teaching of the apostles. Beattie says he did this to draw men away from the love of sin, and to excite them in devotion to well-doing and perseverance therein. So this didactic, this teaching and admonitory function of musical worship that Beattie describes, I think is precisely what we have in Colossians 3.16, when the Apostle Paul says, by teaching and admonishing one another with songs. As the Colossians would sing the truths about Christ, And hear what is sung in the voices of others. Their minds and hearts would be engaged in absorbing this content. The lyrical contents would inform their belief structure, stimulate their faith, and prompt them to align their ethical values and behavior with the teaching about Christ. Interestingly, Paul uses three different terms to describe the varied forms of musical worship. Psalms, hymns, and songs. Most interpreters have suggested that these are synonymous expressions and that no distinctions can be drawn between them. All three terms do appear in the Septuagint version of the Psalms. In his recent commentary on Colossians, Greg Beale has suggested that Paul may even have had Psalm 67 and 76 in mind when he wrote this. Psalm 75.1, for instance, uses all three of these terms at the outset of the psalm. Beale concludes that Colossians 3.16 refers to actual psalms or songs and hymns composed on the basis of such psalms, which would now be related to the new revelation of Christ. Well, I think it's certainly easy to conceive of Jewish believers in Christ 
living in the Lycus Valley, living at Colossae or Laodicea or Herapolis, moved by the Spirit to compose psalms of praise to Messiah and to do so based upon the content and inspiration of the Old Testament Psalter. But what about Gentile followers of Christ who represented the majority of the people in those churches who were raised with their own distinctive musical styles and earnestly desired to praise Christ with forms that were uniquely Anatolian, Greek, or Roman, or possibly even unique to the folk style of the Lycus Valley. At the minimum, I would contend that, three different, that the three different musical terms that Paul uses here are a rhetorical way of expressing musical variety in the worship of the Colossian church. But there may be some discernible distinctions of musical forms represented with the terms themselves. The term hymn, for instance, one that we're so familiar with, was commonly used by Greeks for their form of musical praise to the numerous gods and goddesses throughout the Greco-Roman world. Hymns were written in honor of Demeter, Apollo, Hermes, Aphrodite, and many, many other deities dating from uh, the classical period. Homeric hymns contain a strong didactic or teaching element and reveal epithets and attributes of the gods. Key events associated with their ascent to Olympus, as well as the strengths, abilities, and special areas of influence with which each god or goddess is concerned. The composition of hymns in honor of the gods was widespread in the religious traditions of the Hellenistic and Roman era. These were often sung in praise to the various deities in their temples. Of special interest for us is the inscriptional evidence from Western Asia Minor. There are numerous occurrences of the word hymn from inscriptions all along the west coast of Asia Minor, as well as related terms like hymn singing, choral singers, singing of a hymn, a choir master, a composer of hymns, and many other cognate terms. In fact, an entire guild of hymn writers who composed hymns in honor of the most holy goddess Artemis is referred to in an inscription from Ephesus. This evidence would overwhelmingly suggest that for Gentiles living in the Lycus Valley, the term hymn and its cognates would be associated with the kind of musical worship that they were accustomed to in honor of their traditional gods and goddesses. On the other hand, the word psalm is really quite rare in the inscriptions of Asia Minor and possesses Jewish overtones. It does, however, appear on an inscription from nearby Aphrodisius, but this is a Jewish inscription that refers to a certain Benjamin as a psalmologos, a, a psalm singer. The verbal form, salo, means to pluck or play strings on musical instruments, but it too is rare in the inscriptions from Asia Minor. But in general, psalm was a term used frequently in Jewish contexts. It's especially prominent in the Septuagint, particularly in the titles of numerous psalms, such as the many uh, ascribed as a psalm of David. In fact, the entire Psalter is named after this word. Given the extensive usage of this term, psalmos, in Jewish contexts, and the word humnas, him, in Greek culture, to me it seems best to take these two terms as reflecting musical variety in form, particularly as it relates to Jews and Greeks. The one but diverse manifestation of the body of Christ in Colossae consisted of both Jews and Greeks. Despite their oneness, their cultural distinctiveness and backgrounds persisted. What Paul is communicating here is a warrant for diversity of cultural forms in the worship styles of the gathered community. 
The final word of the trio, songs, is a more general word for songs and is not the unique domain of either of the cultural groups. It's used throughout the Septuagint many times in the book of songs, Psalms. But it's also used extensively in Greek literature beginning as early as the Homeric hymns. It seems best then to conclude that the apostle is using these three terms not in an undifferentiated synonymous manner, but as a rhetorical way of commending diversity of forms of musical styles in the house churches of Colossae and the Lycus Valley. Now, I've got to admit, in studying this and reflecting on it, this emphasis on diversity of forms has been very encouraging to me. I grew up in a rural farming community in central California, and my dad contracted to harvest alfalfa hay for a man named Buck Owens. And another guy named Merle Haggard lived a little further down the road. So I've concluded that diversity of forms can refer to both country and Western music, (laughs) and that's a very good thing. But the one commonality between all three terms used to describe these forms is the adjective spiritual. The adjective does not modify just the last term, thus spiritual songs, but characterizes all three. It may have been placed last in the Greek text for emphasis. The psalms, hymns, and songs are all spiritual in that the Holy Spirit was active in encouraging, moving, prompting, and inspiring the composition of these songs in a variety of cultural forms, to the praise and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Spirit was also involved in the hearts and minds of those singing these songs, instructing, encouraging, admonishing them through the lyrics that they were singing. I believe this is part of what Paul talks about in Ephesians when he says, be filled with the Spirit by singing psalms, hymns, and songs. In the final line of this brief passage, Paul says, with gratitude singing in your hearts to God. Although the word for gratitude here, charis, is the same word that is frequently translated grace in Paul's writings, it's better to interpret it here as referring to the heart of gratitude, as the NIV, ESV, and a number of other translations render it. Thanksgiving or gratitude is the appropriate response to the mercy, kindness, and generosity that the Lord has shown to us. Paul uses it elsewhere in this sense, such as the Corinthians, when he claims, thanks or charis be to God for his indescribable gift, or thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This also fits with Paul's conclusion to the immediately preceding section where he ends with the admonition to be thankful. In the next verse, he concludes the entire section by encouraging the Colossians to give thanks to God. So singing praise to God is an appropriate way of giving thanks to him. There's two levels on which the singing takes place. Paul says that the audience, on one level, is one another and has a teaching function. But on another, it's vertical. It's addressed to God and is an expression of gratitude to him. The musical worship is not only received by God, but Paul teaches teaches that it should also engage every individual within the body and should do so quite deeply in their thinking and in their emotions, which is expressed by the phrase, in your hearts, as they sing these lyrics of praise to God. In the parallel passage, believers sing their praise to the Lord in Ephesians 5.19. And in my mind, this raises the possibility that Paul's reference to God here in Colossians 3.16 might even speak of Christ. This would be consistent with the Christological emphasis of this entire letter and the high Christology of the Colossian hymn. The early church practice of singing hymns of praise to Christ as God is illustrated by the words of an ancient secular writer. It's mentioned by a man named Pliny, often referred to as the younger Pliny, 
to distinguish him from his father. In a letter that he wrote to the emperor, Trajan, in which he shares his observations of a Christian meeting in northern Asia Minor, specifically Bithynia and Pontus, that took place in the early 2nd century. He says this, They met regularly before dawn on a fixed day to sing verses alternately among themselves in honor of Christ as if to a God. Amazing testimony. The early church apparently celebrated the person and work of Christ in the lyrics of their songs. They let the teaching about Christ dwell in them richly, and that was noticeable even to outsiders. I've often thought how wonderful it would be if an archaeologist were to discover an ancient papyrus hymnal from those days. But perhaps we do have a glimpse into early Christian worship with some of the hymns in the New Testament. Okay, let me bring this to a conclusion by drawing out five summarizing implications for the life of the church. Number one, the divinely revealed testimony about the person and work of Christ should permeate our thoughts and shape the way we think about everything. The Word should form and ground our new identity in Christ. The Word should transform our worldviews. The Word should give us purpose and meaning. The Word should assure us of hope and inform our daily lives. The Word should shape the aspirations of our hearts. Secondly, for us, the Word of Christ is found in the Scripture. The Bibles that we possess contain the words of Christ, the teaching about Christ, and the prophetic and typological anticipation of Christ. Paul says elsewhere that the Scripture is God-breathed. Because it is from God, it is completely true and fully trustworthy. And because it is from God, it should hold a central place in our lives and in our Christian communities. Three, although in non-literate cultures, the lyrics of music have been an effective way of teaching divine truth to people, we have the benefit of many different modalities for hearing and absorbing the word of Christ. In contrast to the Colossian believers, we have the benefits of individually possessing copies of the Bible. We can pick them up and read them anytime we want, in print or on our phones. We can listen to the words of Scripture in our cars as we drive to work or do our household chores. We have a multitude of opportunities for letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. Fourth, nevertheless, the lyrics of music remain a powerful way of communicating divine truth to people in the church today. And this passage provides a warrant and an admonition for the ongoing creation of hymns, of praise to Christ in many different forms that are deeply Christological. I praise God for some of the Christian music today that is richly theological and conveys truth about Christ and his work. Such songs help scriptural truth become more deeply anchored in our souls. I'm thankful for contemporary worship songs like In Christ Alone or Living Hope and older hymns such as Holy, 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 What a Wonderful Savior, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, Crown Him with Many Crowns, and so many, many more. But there is a need, friends, for a new set of songs for a new generation. Pray for a new generation of songwriters that they may be filled with the Spirit and have the courage to write songs that are richly biblical in content. Five, and finally, letting the Word of Christ dwell in us richly should affect our emotions and lead us to praise and thanksgiving. So as we ponder and meditate on the person and work of Christ, it should touch our hearts deeply deeply. 
The study of theology is doxological. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Father, I thank you for your precious word. Thank you that you've given us the word about Christ in the pages of scripture. Let it permeate our thinking. Let it richly dwell in us. May it shape who we are. May it motivate us to engage in mission. May it motivate us to love after the pattern of Christ. And may we be found pleasing in you, Father. We thank you for this amazing little verse in your word and all that we can learn from it. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.